the beloved Q6600, one of the most popular of all Core 2 quads. Released in early 2007, it was part of Intel's first line of quad-core CPUs that really weren't true quad cores. They were closer to what Intel did with the dreaded Pentium D by placing two dies on a single chip. In the case of the Q6600, these were two E6600s. The difference between the Core 2 quads and the Pentium D, though, was that these worked. The Core 2 quad brought workstation-like performance to desktops at really a fraction of the price. The Q6600 was a 2.4 GHz 65 nanometer CPU with 8 megs of L2 cache, 4 megs per E6600. As this was one of the lower priced quads, it only featured a frontside bus of 1066, but many used that to their advantage. Since all but the extreme processors had lock multipliers, the only way to overclock it was to raise the frontside bus. Raising the frontside bus to 1333 brought the CPU up to a clean 3 GHz. If your motherboard didn't support manual FSB adjustments, you could simply block off a couple of the pads on the bottom side of the CPU with a piece of tape. This is what I'll be doing. Once overclocked, we'll run a couple benchmarks, test a few games, and see what the speed difference is against the stock speed. So let me show you how I'm going to do this. This trick should work on any any socket 775. I haven't tried it on the Pentiums um, because we'll, they just already run hot and they run like crap to begin with, so I just don't even bother. But uh, this is a 1066. We're going to raise the front side bus up to 1333, and that will raise the speed of the processor up to 3 gigahertz. If this, if you have a, a Core 2 Duo or Core 2 Quad that's already 1333, well, you're out of luck because you're just going to put it right where it's supposed to be at. I have heard that these will support up to, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, um, six, what is it, 1666 or something like that, uh, front side bus, but I've never come across one myself because, well, I just haven't. Uh, they might be out there, and uh, I haven't really looked on Intel's website to see you know, what has been released for that, but that's a possibility. You can put that in the comments if you'd like. But anyway, so we have this. So let's just flip this over. And yes, I do wear gloves when I'm dealing with these because I'm sick and tired of, you know, you clean the CPU off of all the thermal grease, you think you're good, and then before you know it, you got some on your hand and it's smeared all over a bunch of stuff that you touch. So I just wear gloves, it makes things a lot easier. So anyway, you flip it over and you can see we're at the bottom of the chip here. And you have these three pins or these three pads. So I've read once that if you cover these two, these two pads here, it will raise it to 1666. I could be wrong. Again, if I am, leave it in the comments. Uh, but these are the ones that we're going to cover. And by doing these two here, it will raise it to 1333. It'll fold the motherboard into thinking. Now, if you already have a motherboard where you can manual, manually select the, uh, the front side bus, don't, don't even worry about this. You can do it through the bias. It's a lot easier. Now, this one's already been done. But I'm going to pull this one off because this could be a bit of a pain in the butt to put on and take off all the time. So we're going to take that off. I'm going to show you what I do. You can use electrical tape. Um, I just use regular masking tape. And what I do is cut a small slit. I'm doing this with my left hand, so it's not easy. It's, having a camera is a pain in the butt because you can't see what the hell you're doing. So let's take that off. And there's the slit. And I'm just going to cut a very small piece out of it. And there it is. And then we're just going to go and lay this on the processor. And I think I have the sticky side up. I don't want that. This is a lot easier to do when you're not filming. Because I got the camera in my way and everything else, I'm trying to explain this. But just cut a small slit and just lay it over top. I know it's not like, you know, super sturdy, but that's enough to block the pin from hitting. Uh, electrical tape does work. You can use that. I've actually heard people use um, like paint markers and they just draw over top of it a few times. They let it dry and then draw a couple extra layers. The only question or the only issue I'd have with that is the pins in the socket, you don't want to gum them up because it, you're not going to be able to fix those unless you have a microscope and a lot of patience or possibly solder on a new socket. 
or, or put on a new socket, it, it, most people are not going to want to do that. So just be very careful. If uh, Also, what was it? Uh, nail polish. Some people use nail polish. Again, you can use it. I just, my, my concern is gumming up, you know, the pins in the socket. So that's all you have to do is do this and then do the same thing for this one. Put it in. Now, if you have Windows 10, if you don't have, uh, if you have, uh, what is it called? Um, quick boot or something like that. If you have that enabled uh, and you shut the computer down, it's not actually shutting it down. It's actually going into like a hybrid hibernation. So it's not going to detect this processor as being anything different. So you're going to shut down, do this, put it in, and the processor is going to show the same speed as it did before. You either got to reboot, you got to either boot it up after this and then do a, an actual reboot. Don't shut it down, do an actual reboot. And then you, it, it should show. Or you can turn off fast boot and uh, when you do a shutdown, it actually you know, shuts down and it'll do a clean boot, you know, when you, boot, when you turn it back on. So that's pretty much it. Now you be, might be wondering, you know, how reliable is this and how well, you know, will it perform? I've never really had any problems with it, you know, locking up or anything like it, it seems to, to almost be what this chip was meant to meant to do it works perfectly i've never had a problem it's not to say that there won't be problems but if there is you're not doing any damage to the processor you're not adding any extra power to it all you have to do is just remove those pads and you're right back to where you were so if you ever do this and you experience blue screens lockups or it's just for whatever reason not stable you just take the pads off and, and go about your business if you do this properly you're not going to be damaging the cpu you're not putting extra power to it or anything like that it is going to make it run harder but adequate cooling you know it, you'll be fine it's not going to hurt anything years ago when i was working in it we were a company that was contracted by various other companies to you know handle their it and we had a lot of school districts one school district in particular uh, had a local graphics firm donate, God, I think it was like 500 computers. And a lot of them were workstations with Xeons, but a lot of the smaller ones were Core 2 quads. But I noticed when I was building the image on one of them that it was a Q6600, but it was showing 3 gigahertz. Pulled the processor out out of curiosity and found that they had done something like this. So all the ones that they donated were already overclocked. Uh, and they were OEM systems. I think they were Lenovo's. And we filled up labs full of these things and never had a problem. They all ran it at the overclock speed and never had a problem. And these schools were older buildings, so their AC wasn't exactly great. Let's put it that way. So in the summer, or when it got close to the summer, the school wasn't in on, in on the summer. They, you know, the, the rooms were kind of warm. Never had a problem with these. They just ran with, you know, it, as if it was meant to be done. So, um, you know, you might run into problems. Again, just take that off um, and go about your business. But for the most part, I've never, never had a problem doing this with these. They, they run great. And it does give you a little bit of a, a little bit more performance. It actually doesn't make it super fast, but it does uh, kind of take the edge off. Things that were a little bit sluggish before suddenly just work. It's like adding 50 horsepower to your car. It's not going to be a supercar, but it, it does make things a little bit easier. So first up, Cinebench. The 3 gigahertz run took about 8 minutes, 28 seconds with a score of 1528. While the 2.4 gigahertz run took about 10 minutes, 35 seconds and got a score of 1247. And that's about a 23% improvement. Video encoding with handbrake showed about a 4% improvement as well. This allowed the 3 gigahertz run to finish in nearly 30 minutes while the stock run took about 36. So can you mine with the Core 2 Quad? Well, I mean, you can. You'll probably pay more in electricity than you'll ever get out of it. But regardless, the 2.4 gigahertz run got us about 490 hashes per second. While at 3 gigahertz, we got 597 hashes per second. And that's using Monero. Portal 2. We didn't even have to test this since Portal will run decently on a Pentium 4. But the frame rates were about the same as we ran out of GPU. You can see the GPU usage sitting at or close to 100, so the frame rates are going to be the same across both. BeamNG. We also pushed the GPU to its limits with this. I'm only running a GT1030 in this PC, so it's not much. But we can see the frame rates are about the same. One thing I did notice, though, is I played each. Uh, for whatever reason, the stock clocks pulled in slightly better f FPS in some parts. I'm not sure if this is because it's not dogging the GPU as hard and it leaves a little bit more room to breathe, but regardless, they're about the same with some higher speeds with the stock clock. GTA 4. 
As usual, I'll use the same graphic settings across each run. I saw about a 9 to 10 FPS increase with the overclocked run versus the stock one. Besides the frame rate improvement, any areas that had any kind of micro stutter with the 2.4 GHz run really were stutter free at 3 GHz. And you can also see that the GPU usage is much higher with the 3 GHz run. The build-in benchmark also confirms this. GTA 5. GTA 5 ran great. I'm going to say that there was about a 5 to 10 FPS increase with the overclock CPU, and the same goes with the micro stutter, and the game just felt smoother all around at 3 GHz. So again, overclocking this chip, 600 MHz is just enough to take the edge off, and it was something a lot of us did back when it was new. The amazing part though is that this chip is almost 15 years old, and it can still be used today, you know, if you really wanted to. So for those that weren't around back then, imagine what it was like for us to go from a Pentium 4 to this. So if you made it to the end, I want to thank you and uh, leave a comment about anything you'd like to see or any personal experiences you might have had. And I'll uh, talk to you next time. Bye-bye.